Here we are again, Leanne. Goodness gracious. It, Another week. <laughs> it's been a big week too, hasn't it? I think after last weekend and, you know, and the conversations that we've been seeing online um, and also from our political kind of representatives, it's just outrageous what's been going on. I'm just seeing here Caleb um, Thade. Thank you so much for joining in. Elizabeth Close as well. Uh, Nicole Chaffee. Oh, Zane Saunders back again. Good to see you, Zane. I think you've come to almost every one as, as well as uh, Sharina Clanton. Yeah. Lots of people coming into the room. Thanks for coming in on this Friday afternoon. And I'm here in Sydney in a wet, cold Sydney. Where are, how are you going in Adelaide there, Leanne? Oh, Nikki, it's lovely and warm here. It's 19 degrees. Yeah, Very yeah. nice in the sun. Yeah. Warm, is it? All right. It's 19 degrees here in Sydney as well. I just think of it as cold. That's all. Hey. <laughs> But it's cold inside. It's cold in the in the shadows. Yes, that's so true. So true. Lots of people coming in now. Um, Davina Woods, good to see you. Daryl Harris. Oh, is that Uncle Daryl? I think that is. Um, from Kayaf, good to have you in there. Um, Alison White Oak as well. Lots of people coming in. Great to have you here. And just a, a reminder too, this is all being recorded. So you can actually tell more people. And I think lots of people, Leanne, have been popping in and watching it online at a different time of the, the day. Um, yeah, that's that right. Make it on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. And things, you get a sense that things are kind of getting busier and busier now. Things, different restrictions being lifted or not lifted. Um, mm, lots of mm. conversations about when can we get back in. That some of the galleries around the country are opening uh, as well. Yeah. What about Francesca and Nikki, both your galleries, they've opened now, haven't they? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're obviously on the restricted numbers inside the gallery space, but you know it's um thirteen point five degrees here in downtown Canberra's, and it feels like eleven. So <laughs> I think people do go to galleries when it gets a bit cold. They go in for their cups of coffee and to look at great art. So um, yeah, it's nice to have people in the building. That's for sure. Well, it's great to have you here because you're a great piece of art yourself there, Francesca. Uh, <laughs> you know, well-constructed, well put together, beautiful colour, everything's there. <laughs> it's, it's been a long COVID, as Leanne was saying. <laughs> and it's a very long COVID. Um, but um, great to see you. We've got about 28 people uh, in the room now um, as we kind of build up the numbers and people kind of finding their way in. And yeah, these galleries opening, there's a talk about theatres, especially in Darwin, that they're opening some of their small theatres now. Um, and of course, our cousins across the Tasman, they're now opening up for lots of sporting events and things. So as their restrictions really lift, um, don't know if we're totally over it, you know, in terms of what's going on. But I think there's a, a, a deep kind of commitment to how do we start to go back to working as a community now that we know that our health system is in place and we can look after those who do get sick uh, along the way. It was New great. Zealand's, sorry, we're sleeping. Yeah, yeah. New, New Zealand's, um, excuse me, watching uh, what, what we're going to do with our borders before they open up the Tasman um, and that we can, you know, start exchanging and travelling to each other's countries again. So it's only a matter of time, isn't it? And I think the South Australian Premier is um, the third phase is the 29th of June now. Yeah. Just put that forward. Mm. Lots of uh, people saying hello in the chat as well. Um, uh, we're just saying uh, great to connect again. Wesley, if you have time, please contact me. Oh, she wants to have a date. Uh, <laughs> Nina Woods wants to have a date with me just to say it out loud, just in case people <laughs> were worried. Uh, Francesca saying hello there. Dave Goff. G'day, Dave. Good to see you there. Jason Passfield. Again, in there, Hartley Williams, I don't think we've seen you here before. Um, uh, should we be seen or just the panel members? Just the panel members are being seen here just because we sometimes get quite large numbers there, Hartley. We, get, we have had up to 180 people in these chats. So uh, we found it better to just kind of keep it all very neat and, and tidy um, and help that all through. So if, if you do, though, if you want to, you can use the chat but also there's a Q&A button if you want to place any uh, questions to the panel that you might want to. I'll come back to that when we do a bit of housekeeping. We've got um, about 50 people in the room all up. Um, uh, 
uh, and uh, Alec O'Halloran uh, saying, very uh, please everyone with concerns about copyright from recent weeks, make sure you watch the Australia Council webinar from this morning from the Arts Law Centre on copyright for artists. Excellent answers. 99.9% .9 of all your questions. So if you've got questions about copyright, check out uh, at the Australia Council webinar that was just done this morning, it seems here, about copyright for artists. Really useful. I know there's been lots of conversations about that. Um, yeah, oh. so we have, have a little talk about Oh, here, Serena saying, lots of folks stealing our digital content and not crediting us appropriately. Yes, so I think there is a bit of that going on. Best to kind of look after yourself um, and make sure you're, you're fully armed with all the information there. It's 56 people in the room. We've got two past two. We'll give people a couple more minutes, Leanne, and get into that. There's all this conversation too about festivals, which we're about to hear a little bit more about. Uh, I know today there's a bit of um, information coming out about Kayaf and its digital platforms that they're, they're pioneering or working on as they go forward in this time. Uh, it'd be interesting, a lot of the things that we're putting in place, we may actually be able to do some more mass gather gatherings in the next few weeks or next month as well, but we've got all these digital platforms being put in place, which I think we won't actually step back from. Well, what do you think, Leanne? I think they'll be there forever. I think so too, and I think it's <clears throat> it's another tool of communication. And you know, we don't know how long COVID's going to be around for, uh, and so you know, no doubt. Well, this is going to be the way in which we communicate and meet in in the future. So it'd be I'm fascinated to know how. I mean. I mean, the beauty of festivals is about connecting with people, isn't it? Um, so how's, I don't know how to have a virtual festival. Hmm. I think markets are going to be very useful in the digital environment where you're wanting to purchase oh. things. We'll hear from uh, a number of people who are working in that area. But, it'd be it, yeah, the, the live experience, I don't think we'll ever step back fully from it. I'm just thinking about some of the amazing work that Kalak does in terms of bringing people together in those areas, those, well, gatherings, if not festivals, but the festival environment where people coming together is still important. I've got a question here from Leanne Vent who's saying, where can we find the link to the webinar? Uh, I tried to attend this morning, but the internet dropped out on us. Well, isn't that something, you know, the NBN or the great digital revolution that we've expected to have does have its downsides at times in terms of bandwidth. I might ask um, someone to put that link into the chat box for us I know that we've got a whole group of people in the back room, as we call it, who are beavering away, getting things to get together. Uh, so saying, yeah, Alex saying that it is on the uh, Australia Council website on oh, next week. Here we go. So it will, it may not be there yet, uh, Leanne. It might be something that you can get in there as well. Uh, Lydia's going to answer that question for you. There we go. Um, it's five past two. And here we are. Here we are on Radio Blackfella. Um, <laughs> feels like it sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, we've got about 65 people in the room with us now. And I don't know, Leanne, do you think it's time to get a wriggle on? I reckon. Let's, let's, people can join us as we, we hook into it, hey? Well, let's do that. Michelle, let's, let's pop into the PowerPoint presentation and we'll get into it. Thanks so much, everyone, uh, for coming on board and coming around. Welcome to this one, which is the 12th uh, of these roundtables, these webinars. And today we're talking about festivals. It's the 12th of June, 2020. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Michelle. Um, I'm Wesley Enoch, uh, Kwanda Mooka man from South East Queensland, and I'm the chair of the First Nations Strategy Panel for the Australia Council and joined here by the wonderful Leanne Juniper Buckskin, who's Deputy Chair of the Australia Council for the Arts. Leanne, so lovely to gather together on lots of different countries as we're here now. I wonder if I just pass on to you and just give us the, uh, an acknowledgement of country, please. Thanks, Wesley. It's good to see you again this week. <clears throat> um, well, I, I sit here on Ghana land, uh, which is Adelaide. Uh, those of you who know that country, uh, I acknowledge ancestors, uh, elders both past and present, and those who are emerging amongst us. Um, I also acknowledge all of your countries by which you all currently sit on and, and come and join us on this webinar. 
and acknowledge your elders, both past and present, and ancestors right across this wonderful big country of ours. Uh, it's marvellous. Lots of people popping in, just saying hello again. Um, Avril Quayle there, auntie there from Strabrook Island, just to say hello to family members as they come in. And lots of people sharing in the chat room there. This is, as I said, the 12th First Nations Roundtable. If we go to the next slide, thanks, Michelle. And today we're talking about focusing on festivals and COVID-19 and the strategies that, that people have been putting in place. And just a reminder that we focus very much in these roundtables about connecting, sharing, giving ideas back and forward, really strengthening our networks and navigating our way through this. We've been in lockdown for, oh goodness, in different forms, close to three months now. And it's just that thing of these roundtables have been great ways of keeping these connections and keeping everyone together um, here on Radio Blackfella. So <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> great council, people making a joke out of that one. Uh, yeah, these great things about just focusing on how we can support each other and keep ourselves buoyant because, goodness, it's been a hard week, has it not? I think there's been a pretty tricky time, Leanne. I mean, just with a lot of the rallies last weekend and some of our political leaders coming out in a, I would say, disrespectful kind of misunderstanding of what we were trying to achieve. Oh. And even recently saying that there's been no slavery in this country, you go, what? And oh. even in the, Senate, in the in the federal Senate, um, your auntie, Pauline Hanson, uh, saying- Who's auntie? Oh, isn't she your aunt? <laughs> must be someone's auntie. Not my aunt. Oh, not my auntie. It's Queensland one. mob, that one. Oh, she <laughs> might be my <laughs> But she put forward a, a, a notion in the Senate saying all lives matter. And you go, oh, really? We have to have this conversation again? And even... A great this, deflector, that comment. Yeah. And even now, uh, I mean, lots of conversations going on around uh, uh, HBO taking uh, Gone from the Gone with the Wind, Gone from the Wind, that smells like a fart, that one, but Gone with the Wind off um, because of its depictions of slavery and also some of the Chris Lilly conversation that's um, around his appropriation of especially uh, blackface, brownface uh, and his commentary on, on, on minors. I'd be very interested to hear in the chat whether people have any opinions about this, about is it censorship to, to take these things down or is it the stuff that we've been saying for, for ages, you don't appropriate someone else's identity to make fun of them, you know? Mm appropriate your own identity god knows you you know you've white fellas are funny enough satirize yourselves you, know? you don't need to take someone else's identity sharina clanton straight in there saying nah it's not censorship take it down she's she's in there straight away um we might move to the next slide please michelle i think there's another interesting comment there too um around you know the whole <clears throat> statues around the world and as we can see in the US you know confederate statues now being you know by cities and mayors taking them down once and for all uh, and disbanding those you know I think it's really important and <clears throat> you know as our prime minister said you know what are we going to you know will we be doing that in this country and I'd be interested to know from you know people who are joining us what they think about statues it's been a long conversation in this country also mm. and um you know what, what's your feelings out there about some of the statues even you know we've we've got the 250th anniversary of cook and as we know the government wanted to do a big statue uh honoring him so you know it's a, it's an interesting conversation there's lots of things going on in the world through this um COVID time well, I know that uh, I, uh, a lot of the family who live in, in Cairns and that area and people who travel to Cairns will know there's that massive statue, it's a pretty ugly statue actually, a massive statue of Cook doing a kind of salute, like a hail, hail Hitler kind of salute. It's pretty shocking when you see it. Um, and people saying, what does that mean? There's a couple of conversations here in the, in the chat. I've always been mild, mildly affronted by what Chris Lilly finds funny. Um, William Newbury there saying that. Uh, people saying, oh, maybe we should rename James Cook University. And uh, Jazz Money says, never understood Chris Lilly's success. Good to see it being finally knocked out of the light. And so there you go. There's some interesting kind of conversations. The agenda today, as you can see up on your screen, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. We've got a poll today too. We'll talk about that in a second. A little poll about what we could do and how we could do it. 
uh, raising some key themes from last week's uh, webinar. And we've got uh, three amazing guests. I mean, I, well, you might know this, Leanne, but I have been absolutely so stoked by the power of our women. You know, listening to Pat Turner talking and even just chatting to Francesca, Nikki and Sarah yesterday in our rehearsal, how powerful our women are. Oh, I, just, I just get all excited. You know, that kind of sense of how um, the leadership of our women and just you yourself, just amazing to, to, to witness, to be part of it and to live in the wake of these powerful women as they move through the world and making change. Powerful things, powerful things. Thank you, Wesley. And I think we come from a line of great female leaders, um, you know, and that's it's also a, a t testament to our community as well, the value of women within our community mm. and how we hold them in these spaces to be, you know, fierce leaders. Absolutely. Don't get on the wrong side of an auntie. <laughs> no. Goodness. Um, there, we, uh, we've got a few more things here just saying that... Um, uh, it's a privilege helping the community write up uh, how they run their festival. This is Mark Stapleton and talking about language and white government language there. Um, Clive is now saying uh, there, are, there are many streets in Darwin and Alice Springs named after police who actively pursued and murdered First Nations people. Okay, some interesting things there. How do we do it? Gabrielle saying seven sisters, deadly as, I reckon, deadly as. Uh, on the agenda there, we've got resources. We'll talk a little bit more about what the Australia Council has to offer and also the next round table. If we go to the next slide, please, Michelle. So a little bit of housekeeping, as you, as you see here, and we'll come to a poll in a second, but I just want to, for those who haven't been here before, if you take your cursor on your screen and pop down to the bottom of your screen, you'll just see their um, participants. You can double tap on that and have a look at who's around. Have a quick little Doris about who's in the room. We've got 79 of us sitting in for this chat. So, you know, be the Doris, go up and down, have a quick little look, who's in, who's out, or who you might want to talk to, who, you know, you want to date because Davina is going to date me in a second. Um, we've also got the chat box. You can double tick, click on that and you can see all of these uh, chats happening. Kath saying, let's have some statues of powerful First Nations women leaders. Yeah, bring it on. I'm all for it. Um, Frederick uh, Gesher saying, statues are nothing but symbols of the regime and constant reminders of who's in charge. That's why I think we need some more women there. Um, and here, Sharina saying she's been exhausted all week. You mob anyone else? I know, Leanne, you were talking about being exhausted before. Mm. It's, there's been a lot going on in our mind. All that in the chat room, folks. Get in there, have a little chat, talk to people. Uh, also, there's a Q&A box, and I see uh, Leanne saying thank you for her, uh, for the answers that we've, uh, we've been put in there. So uh, great to to have your Q&A there. If you've got a very specific question that you want to ask of the panel, whack it in there and Leanne and I will keep an eye on that. There's also a closed caption. So we've got, I think it was Nikki, I think her name was as well, who's the captioner who's working with us today, that if you are, if your connection's hard and you can't get, you can't hear what's going on or it's better for you to read rather than try to listen, the captioning's there and it's closed captioning. Uh, also, that it, there's sometimes some issues that we might have with bandwidth, so we might have to, you know, just stay on on uh, the the audio rather than the video, video. That'll all kind of happen, but you know what it's like. We're all living in this digital age. We're all getting through it. Um, and there's sometimes you might just see us kind of disappear or appear, depending on where you're going. Now, here's something that's going to pop up, pop up on your screen in a, in a short second. Renee in the back room is going to pop up a... Uh, a survey and we'd really like you to answer some very simple questions and I'll talk you through it when it all comes up. This is a, uh, a, a survey to help us think about what the future is. So you can take your cursor and you can answer these questions. Would you like to see the First Nations roundtables continue? This has been 12. Have they been useful to you? Would you like to see more of them? Just uh, answer yes or no. Just click on that. And then the next question there is how often would you like to see them occur? weekly, fortnightly, monthly, or quarterly, every three months. Leanne, well, I mean, we've been doing this weekly. Goodness yeah. gracious. It's been a regular thing. Some people call it church. Some people say it's like going to church on a Friday afternoon. 
which I don't know what church you go to. I never went to church. You might be, <laughs> right you might be entering a new career. <laughs> <laughs> the Friday afternoon was getting ready for a Friday night. I don't know where you <laughs> and maybe Church in my house is a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> Lockdown, no way. Um, the next question there is what time frame uh, should the format be? This is, we've normally been doing 90 minutes. We get three speakers and things, but you think 30 minutes, nice, short, sharp, in, out, um, 60 minutes or 90 minutes? What do you think? Add your little answer there. Um, just quickly tick on something. Sometimes your first response is the best response anyway. And then going down, just scrolling down to the last question, what content would, be, uh, would, like to, would you like to see addressed? Um, me speaking English would help, but this idea of what do you think you'd really like to see in this? Uh, you can actually do multiple um, answers here. Don't, don't say all of them. That's just, you know, give us the top three, if you like, of the three things you really want to get to see uh, in this. And then just hit submit. Okay, I'm going to give you just three seconds to hit submit. Have you answered all the questions? Because we're going to get some answers straight away. Yeah, has everyone filled out the questionnaire? Look, oh, I can see Sharina putting her answers here. You've got to make sure you put it in the, in the little thing there, love, in the, in the questionnaire. Hit submit. It'll disappear. Okay, this is the last five seconds. And, okay, all submitted, all good stuff. All right, well, um, Renee, show us what the results were there. Renee's in the back room just kind of moving th things around. 100% of you, oh, goodness, 100% oh, wow. of you said you want to see it again. Okay, oh, that means more work for you, Leah. Goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> we'll be back again. Um, how often would you like to see it? Okay, it's a bit mixed here. Just under half of you say fortnightly, but people, like a, a third of you say weekly, another third saying monthly. So pretty regularly is what I'm hearing there. So pretty regularly. And what time frame? Oh, look, overwhelmingly, almost two thirds of you saying 60 minutes would be right. 60 minutes. We'll be the new, we'll be the black 60 minutes. That's how <laughs> we'll do it. Don't need that channel nine. We've got, you know, radio Blackfella here. Um, Almost 90% of you saying you want to hear more about creative practice and cultural knowledge. So that's really big. And then pretty much everything else is, is well, at least over half people wanting to get all those ideas, but I can see very clearly creative practice and cultural knowledge. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. Look, this is just that's a straight. Right. It's a, it's a way of just helping us get to where we need to get to. You can press close then and you can get back to the presentation. Uh, so yes, there's, there's lots of things there and Hartley Williams in the chat, there saying who's measuring the true impact of the current health crisis in terms of our performing arts sector for all teaching and, and choreographers, for example, each company or individual member keeping statistics for data collection purposes. Good idea. Actually, if it's had a, uh, an economic impact on you, if, uh, you, you, the money you've been spending or losing, uh, in the process, that could be all very interesting to look at. So a little so bit... Basically, of Wesley, you know, organisations will be g gathering that data themselves and it'll be measured against uh, some of the funding requirements. Um, you know, I've sat on funding uh, for state funding where you have to give a COVID statement, how the it is impacting the <clears throat> your organisation. So that certainly is um, being measured in term, like you said, in terms of, um, you know, financials, but I think health is very much a part of it too in, within that conversation. I think too that in different jurisdictions around the country, it would be good to maybe even put some of this data together into a letter to your arts funding body in the state. That could be an interesting thing to, to keep. Um, uh, yeah, and that there's kind of ideas and, and things to be shared in that world. Let's move on to the next slide then, please, Michelle. Um, some key issues that came... Wasn't a fantastic webinar last week? It oh, was that, yeah, it was great, wasn't it? Young people just filled me with such pride, such pride. You've got to love their energy. Proper old man <laughs> against these amazing people. Um, do you want to take us through some of this, uh, some of the key issues that came through, Leanne, from last yes. week? Thanks, Wesley. Well, we had three amazing young people, uh, Sienna, 
um, who spoke about her work uh, with the Mulka Project. So the Mulka Project up there in Yurikala um, is a fantastic uh, 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 program where they're taking historical material and footage um, and, you know, looking at opportunities to work with new work and current technologies and recording all of that sort of material as well. But they're also really launching into the world of AR and VR. Um, the other thing I think that was really important about what Sienna was saying is that she, the Mulka Project, um, and I apologise for that spelling there, um, Mulka Project, uh, Watami, Wanakai? Uh, I hope I've spelt that uh, said that correctly. Um, it was a showing, an exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales as part of the Biennale of Sydney. So whilst people like Sienna, um, there's a lot of young people within this organisation that are being trained up, they have opportunity to be parts of great uh, Biennales like that of um, at the Art Gallery of New South Wales uh, in Sydney. Uh, Sienna is taking a gap year. She's just finished year 12 and um, she's going to, after her gap year, uh, do a Bachelor of Communication at QUT because her she's very, very passionate, as we all saw, um, working with her community and giving back to that community of Yurikala. Uh, Emily Johnson uh, spoke about her role at Carriage Works as Program Coordinator of the Solid Ground Project. Um, it's an art and education program, working with young people in schools. I think a really important area um, uh, of work that needs to be done in schools. Uh, Solid Ground focus on youth education also provides a platform for teaching artists, allowing for a two-way learning ex uh, process. And we hear that a lot right across our communities, this, this idea of two-way learning. Uh, an exchange. Emily also gave uh, an overview of her social media presence. She's an amazing visual artist as well um, and she explores her own lived uh, experience through mediums, um, these mediums which she's described as political activism through art. Um, I know that there were people were very much interested in her visual art and where they might be able to purchase some of her work. Our final speaker was Ryan Clappy, also known as Dobby. Um, he spoke of his honour of receiving the Australia Council's First Nations uh, Emerging Career Development Award uh, this year, and that was with the project Marshmallow uh, that he will be working on as a result of the, of the award, which is a new album. Uh, Ryan, uh, Dobby also discussed his growth as an artist in the connection between music, culture and family. Um, he uses music to connect with a culture he didn't grow up knowing about. Um, but he also spoke quite passionately about the effects of COVID, both on his music, home and working life. I mean, he was a young man that was basically, as you said last week, Wesley, left homeless because of this COVID uh, situation. Um, so he's been forced to go back home to Brewarana and um, spend time with his family. Uh, and be on country. So that was the three unbelievable young people we had last week. And it was great because we had that conversation because we, we, on Friday we knew that there were going to be these rallies around the country on the Saturday that followed. Right. And we had a fantastic conversation of what it means to have positivity and hope to have storytelling that's on the public um, uh, agenda, if you like, and to really give a, a, a very positive energy for young people so that they don't, well, you know, they don't feel that they, they are as neglected or they are um, downtrodden, that they feel strong in themselves and their culture. And I got a really strong sense of that from those three speakers. A few things in the chat coming through. Um, Jazz uh, Money saying uh, that... Um, uh, across the ditch there in Aotearoa that uh, the, the Prime Minister there has announced a $4 million uh, grant for 500 programs taking creatives into schools and they'd love to see that some of that here in, in uh, Australia. Uh, and, you know, um, Hartley saying he's listening to Baker Boy, the Yungle people, great to, to hear all that, I, that there. Um, lots of people kind of jumping in and saying, yes, the funding cuts for the arts programs much of the decrease uh, to the board, is there, are there cuts coming along the way? And we don't quite know yet. If anything, I'm hearing that there are 
money's coming forward, but exactly who gets to distribute them is the bigger question. And I know the states have been very good at looking at um, supporting and getting uh, more uh, money to artists and mostly organisations. So check out your local jurisdictions about how you can support that. Next slide. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Just, I'm a theatre person. It's good, you know, often it's this classic thing of the great pyramid. You see three or four performers on stage and you think that's it. But in fact, this just takes you through the different layers and, and levels of influence that has. So yes, there's, you know, a couple of performers on stage or, in this case, you might see the work of uh, a couple of artists, let's say, even if it's, it's work on a, uh, you know, a painting on a wall hung, hung there in a gallery. But then you start to see all the people behind it, all the support crew, the production, the creatives, going down to the green area there, the technical support that happens from installers and lighting, uh, and marketing as well, as we go down into the kind of, the orange area, we see venues, that there's cleaners, there's security, um, there's all that support staff that happens there. In the red area there, the associated support. So you get legal advice, accounting advice, transport, um, different catering. There's a whole range of things there, documentation and filming. And then in the purple area on the bottom there, then also looking at, you know, some people travel and looking at um, accommodation and food and uh, uh, and catering in, in, for the audiences as well. There's a whole range of things that it's not just what you see as you go to a theatre or you go into a gallery or you go into a cinema. It's not just what you see. It's all of these people behind the, the making of the work that are also part of the arts industry and we have to keep things going in that way. Next slide. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, I can talk under wet concrete, can't I, Leanne? Just go, go, go. I can, hear, I can hear everyone out there in the world going, oh, does that man ever shut up? No, he doesn't. That's his problem. Um, so, Leanne, we've got three, as I said, three amazing speakers, really powerful women in their own right. Um, Francesca Cabillo, who's the senior curator of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Art at the National Gallery of Australia, but she's also talking to us here as the chair of the Darwin Aboriginal Art Foundation Sarah Bell, who's the First Nations lead associate producer with Il Bidri Theatre in the Australian performing arts market, and the wonderful Nikki Cumston. And I've just noticed too that Nikki has an OAM. She got a gong recently. Um, Yay! In recognition for her uh, amazing stuff. She's just got uh, such incredible work there in terms of curator of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales and the artistic director, Tanandi. Uh, Festival of Contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art uh, there in Adelaide. Lots of people saying congratulations, Nikki. Lots of people just kind of getting in there. Hey, who said this? Wesley, you can talk the head off an emu. Watch out. Why oh, would I want to do that? Um, Leanne, I might lead to you and you want to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Wesley. Okay, Michelle. Introducing... Francesca Cabello, a long, long associate uh, in the industry. It's great to see you, Francesca. How are you feeling through this this very strange period of 2020? Uh, Leanne, lovely to be here with you and Wes and Lydia, the OZCO team, and the wonderful guests and participants, fellow panellists. Um, look, I suspect um, I'm feeling like everyone else, um, quite uh, tired, um, overwhelmed, anxious, um, angry, frustrated, um, proud, um, you know, all of these mixed emotions. It's, you know, a really, really difficult time, I suspect, for all of us. We, we started two weeks ago with National Sorry Day and Reconciliation Week, um, Marbo Day, you know, we've, we've reflected on the anniversary of the referendum, but in the same token, we've, we've seen um, racism, we've seen um, sacred sites uh, desecrated, destroyed. Um, and we've also seen how globally um, people are really determined to 
ensure that people of color, indigenous people, black people um, are, are actually given some um, degree of, of support, respect. Uh, there's a lot of allyship happening. So yeah, I think like everyone, I'm, I, I'm excited to be here with you all, but equally I share collectively a sense of um, anger, frustration, um, pride and resilience. So it's, it's, it's a really, um, 2020, what a year, hey? We will never forget it. No. Ever. Well, Francesca, I'm going to hand the slide over to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. And can I also say, um, you know, on behalf of um, my ancestors, um, the Bardi, the Yanua, the Larrakia, and the Waterman, the, um, I respectfully pay my, um, uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the ACT region. I, I, I um, really want to uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge their ancestors, their elders, and the broader community. Um, Canberra is such a, a, an amazing location, both uh, uh, culturally, spiritually, and geographically, and and I know that that there are many people who, whose whose memories, whose um, ancestors come from this region. So I pay my respects to them. I'm uh, also again wanting to thank the Australia Council for this invitation, uh, Lydia, Leanne, Wesley, the broader Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Department for this invitation to participate and the chance to speak to you with my fellow panelists, Nikki and Sarah. Um, could I have the first slide, please? So uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the chair of the Darwin Aboriginal Art Foundation. And I wanna provide you with a little bit of information. I've, I, I told Wesley I'll put my timer on because like him, I could talk under concrete. So um, I pressed the timer, so I've got 10 minutes. If there's a loud buzz, I'll know when to stop. But I did want to say that the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair was originally conceived and designed to complement the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Awards in Darwin. And as this was the opportunity that art centres and their artists saw to participate by exhibiting and selling their work to a broader public during the Nazia opening events period. Therefore, the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair and the Darwin Aboriginal Art Foundation are very much about supporting Aboriginal owned and operated art centres. So as you can see in the uh, slide that I have in front of you, the, the vision for the foundation is that it's to provide a vibrant and exciting platform for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art and culture with a particular reputation for innovation, diversity and cultural integrity. The history of the foundation and the fair is that it was established in 2007, hosting some 16 art centres and it has grown remarkably to support and showcase over 70 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art centres from across Australia. It is the oldest and the premiest and, and largest event of its kind that brings together Indigenous owned art centres from across Australia. As you can see in this slide, it provides sales, marketing and professional de development opportunities for art centres, assisting in their aspirations for economic independence and sustainability within the broader art sector. In the bottom right hand of the slide, you'll see some links also to both our Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair Foundation website, to the National Indigenous Fashion Awards website 
and also to our curators program. So please, if you get the chance to write them down and, uh, and to visit those sites. In 2011, the Not-for-Profit Foundation was formed and is governed by a board of nine representatives with representation from Indigenous cultural leaders, Larrakia representatives, art centre managers, peak body representatives and industry specialists. Our current board members include Dorianne Raymond, Philip Watkins, Lindley Naguda, Joanne Russo, Cecilia Alfonso, Christina Davidson, Tarun Sharman and Pamela Bigelow. If I could have the, um, actually no, before we go to the next slide, you'll see in the top right hand side, the events that the foundation does uh, support, develop and deliver. They're the art fair, they are the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair Foundation public programs. There is a cultural keepers program. There's the country to couture fashion program, fashion, and the, this year, the National Indigenous Fashion Award. Could I have the next slide? Thank you. So as you can see, I'm sharing some images from our event last year. You can see the Tiwi Island dance performance in the bottom left-hand corner, an aerial view of the art fair at, at the convention centre where over 70 Indigenous art centres sold directly to the public. You'll see the children's workshop uh, hosted and delivered by Andiliakwa Arts artists and an image of Country to Couture, a collection that was developed between Bulabula Arts and Julie Shaw. It's important to note that the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair generated some 2.84 million um, in 2019 for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Acts uh, art sector. And this was an increase of 13% direct sales at the fair. Of course, 100% of the sales go directly back to the art centres and their communities. And we can also proudly say that over the past five years, the art fair has generated more than 11.6 million uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art sector. Over 333 Indigenous artists and art staff attended the 2009 fair and interacted with the public. DAF achieved 195 editorial uh, coverages, um, which provided probably about 50 million, 7,014, 400, and 79. I always get all complicated with those figures, but it's a huge amount of uh, media and editorial coverage for our events. Some 13,293 people visited our event, and over the past five years, we've seen more than 47,000 visitors attend the art fair and its associated events. In 2009, we actually had 17,000 people come through our doors. And again, this, these figures are a, a real credit to our artists and to our art centres because people are coming to see them and to learn and understand about the richness of our remarkable art and culture. 90% of our visitors have said that they learnt something new about Indigenous culture at our fair. So that's 90% of visitors said they learnt something new. And 22% of our visitors had never purchased Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander art before coming to the fair. So we're reaching out to a public that, that is really engaged, which is wonderful. And the voice an agency is being led by our artists and our art centres. I see I've got two, three minutes left, so I'll speed it up. <laughs> DAF presented 12, uh, if I could have the next slide, actually, that might be good. 
Daph presented 12 artist workshops at the convention centre and we also welcomed over 900 young people participating in our children's activities. We also had two Indigenous food workshops run by Aboriginal bush traders and Karen Shelder Catering. I think the, the uh, DAF also hosted a series of artist talks, which included the impact of the industry on development on country and its manifestations in the arts. Another artist talks consisted of a discussion around the Desert River Sea project, discussions around from country to couture, and discussions surrounding International Year of Indigenous Languages. You'll see here two pictures of lots of deadly black people. These people are, have been participating in our Cultural Keepers program. This wonderful program is an opportunity for Indigenous people to come together and to share and engage with our arts and culture. And can I say that we, we are running this Cultural Keepers program this year. So please visit our website if you are interested in participating. Basically what we do is we ask participants to, partic to be involved in what will now be a five day program. We match them up with art centres. We ask them to present uh, papers about their work and what they're doing. Uh, and we also uh, ensure that they have the opportunity to build relationships with our artists in art centres. So if I could have the next slide, I really do want to, in the last 40 seconds, <laughs> I'll talk really quick, Wesley and Leanne, I'm sorry. But I wanted to talk about, actually, this, this let's go to the next slide, I think, because um, there we go, responses to COVID-19 and the pandemic. So for us, it was really important to get a sense of how our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art centres were travelling at this time. So we actually contacted uh, um, approximately 50 of our membership uh, and we sought their advice. Uh, they, in fact, my time is up. <laughs> Funny. You're right, Francesca. Just uh, you keep, you keep going. It's not that rigid. We, we've got a little <laughs> Murray time here too. I, that's what not you said earlier offline. Yeah. yeah, but in public, I'm soft. In oh, yeah, private, that's I'm right. Soft. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Uncle. <laughs> so, um, you know, for us, uh, we sought the advice of our membership. So we have approximately 70 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members that are part of our foundation. And we contacted them at the end of March, early April, and we wanted to know how they were coping with the impact of the pandemic. The major concern, as you can imagine, for art centres, staff, artists, and the broader community was to prioritise the health and safety of community members, ensuring that such things as sufficient food and essential items, including medication, were available to those who are now moving back to their homelands. We also contacted the uh, Peak Arts Centre Org to discuss with them uh, the impact of the pandemic on their membership. So we sought advice from Anchor, Desart, IACA and Archwa. Again, trying to ensure that we develop a program that supports our membership. The overall response was that our art centres do want to participate in an online art fair. And so this is what we have embarked on. If you go to our website, you'll see all the details. So this year we are running the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair from the 6th to the 14th of August. We have a little over 50 of our art centres that have registered to participate. 
and we will be working closely with them to support them with digital platforms so that they are able to engage. We're also talking to Arts Law and Copyright Council uh, and, and VizCopy to ensure that all of the information available, the technical requirements to protect the artists, their artworks, uh, as part of um, copyright is, is upheld as we engage in this new direction. We will have a Darwin Aboriginal art um, public program, so workshops and demonstrations. We are running our Cultural Keepers program, uh, a six online sessions. Anyone interested in participating, please contact uh, uh, Shiloh McNamee uh, at our DAF office. Um, the details for the website you'll be able to find. Uh, and of course, this year we are uh, delivering on our inaugural National Indigenous Fashion Awards. The National Indigenous Fashion Awards will be telecast via NITV on the 5th of August at 7.30. The award uh, uh, categories, we, are, we have some six award categories with a total combined prize of $60,000. This is a combination of uh, cash, travel, support, development and promotional opportunities. Um, I do want to just finish with the last thing to say that this wonderful event, our foundation is is run by a very small team. In fact, um, we have one full-time staff member, three part-time staff members, and we bring on, as part of the delivery of the event, four contractors. So I just wanna do a shout out to our one full-time staff member, Claire Summers, Executive Director. She does an amazing job. And shout out to Mandy Tripconi, who is our General Manager, Shiloh McNamee, our public program coordinator, and Nina Fitzgerald, our research and development officer. They are our part-time staff who work with Claire to deliver our program. And then of course, our contract staff, Tammy, Dylan, Mel, and Dave. So thank you everyone. Um, please visit our website. Um, uh, happy to take any questions at this point. Sorry, I went over time. Oh, you're right. There are lots of conversation here just saying how great it is and that these uh, festivals, these gatherings, are wonderful kind of moments of culture. Um, for those who haven't been able to take screenshots or take notes as you go, reminding everyone that this is all going to be on the Australia Council website as well, all of this information. So you can actually tap into that uh, later on if you if all of that was so overwhelming, so much detail there, Francesca, about what the achievements are. And this digital stuff, I mean, uh, from a couple of um, conversations we've had on these webinars, this idea of how do we protect the uh, intellectual property, if not the actual images, you know, um, uh, from being kind of taken away. I mean, you're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. Are there things that you're, you're, you're sharing with others about how to address this there are yeah. technical ways yeah wesley um look what we're very mindful of is that uh this pandemic will have a huge economic impact on our um artists and our uh, uh communities and you will already note on instagram and facebook a lot of our art centers and artists are becoming really innovative in the way they represent themselves online. So I know Arts Law and BizCopy have been very active and I'm sure the Australia Council as well in sharing information. We are um, certainly uh, uh, able to share information as part of our event. Uh, we um, actually host in real time um, in previous years Arts Law um, Australia Council, BizCopy, um, the code to ensure that our artists know uh, what their rights are, um, how they can um, develop their own skills in this area. But I think this is a whole new area for us. So as we are developing these programs, we are also identifying what the priorities are. 
copyright protection is definitely um, one of those key issues, but also what methods, what strategies um, do we need to develop now to help our artists and our art centres to come out of what will be a, 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 a quite a, a different um, economic uh, scenario. Um, when you think about it, 11 million over the last five years. Um, last year, 2.8 million in sales. So I don't think we'll be generating 2.8 million this year, but that means for us as a foundation, we are now talking to experts about how we can develop effective yeah. strategies to ensure that, that we can then start supporting our artists and art centres to come, to think about how they might come out and engage with that um, broader public post the pandemic. Agreed. And like those numbers, really, there are people behind all those numbers. That's dollars yeah. going to artists, to communities, the idea of how we generate a lot of that stuff. I'm aware of time, so we might move on, Francesca, and come yeah, back. Thank you, Wesley. The whole panel. Yeah. Leanne, do you want to introduce us to our next speaker? I sure would. I'd love to um, introduce the lovely Sarah Bell. Sarah is our First Nations uh, lead associate producer with, uh, for APAN, which is the Australian Performing Arts Market and, uh, and works with Elbidgery Theatre Company. How are you, Sarah? Unmute yourself just down the bottom there. How are you going? It's, it's, uh, with everything going on in the world right now, it's a bit, it's tough and it's a bit challenging, but I'm really exhausted this week and yeah, but very happy to be here. And you've just flown in from Brisbane yes, to Melbourne. I, I was stuck in Brisbane um, pre-COVID. So I was, what a beautiful place to be stuck. I know, <laughs> when I left this morning, it was like 16 degrees at like 5 a.m. And then when I landed in Melbourne, it was 4 degrees. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Sarah, can I just say, just pop a little closer to the microphone. That would be great. Is that better? Great. Yeah, that's great. Just it, stay close to the microphone for us. Thanks, Sarah. Well, I'm going to hand it over to you and, um, and just direct um, Michelle to move through your slides. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners and um, just acknowledge everyone that's emerging. <laughs> Um, my name is Sarah Bell and I'm a proud Gamilaroi woman from North West New South Wales. I'm presenting to you from Kulin Nation. Today, Ilbidri is the First Nations lead for APAM. Ilbidri brings extensive expertise and self-determined leadership to APAM and focuses in particular on building capacity, skills and network networks among First Nations art leaders. The First Nations advisory group frames and guides APAM's First Nations relationships and programming. It is made up of senior art, arts industry members with significant market development experience made up of Rachel Mazza, Arnie Nancy Bamagar, Marinda Donnelly, Ben Gratz, and a rotating position with Mugalingan Performing Arts. And Michelle, could we go to the next slide, please? The Australian Performing Arts Market is a strategic initiative of the Australia Council, currently being delivered by Creative Victoria, designed to showcase Australian and New Zealand contemporary dance, theatre, emerging and experimental arts nationally and internationally. APAM's principles are on this slide, central to APAM's continued success in celebration, profiling and mobility of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts, artists, companies and communities. The APAM office has three functions. An APAM office open year round 
to facilitate visitors to Australia based in Melbourne with a national remit. A small dedicated staff of advocates welcomes hosts and connects international artists, presenters and partners with contemporary Australian performance. Hosting one to two APAM gatherings at established festivals around Australia happening across the country. Gatherings are designed to facilitate opportunities for artists and their work nationally and internationally and builds more opportunities for collaboration across the performing arts. Many of you would know our first gathering took place at Asiatopa in Melbourne in February, attended by over 400 delegates. Market intelligence for contemporary art Australian performance. APAM serves as an Australian-based hub of market intelligence that provides contemporary performance nationally and internationally. Next slide, please, Michelle. APAM's gathering, gatherings happen at established festivals across Australia by combining profile, exchange and full length profile performances. They build more opportunities for collaboration across the performing arts and showcase Australian and New Zealand work. The gathering planned in partnership with Darwin Festival in August 2020 was postponed due to the pandemic and, and is now scheduled for August 2021. Due to the uncertainty of when international travel will, res will resume and how it will continue to be impacted by COVID-19, APAM is planning for the likelihood that the Darwin gathering next year will have two modes of engagement running together, a live in-person gathering of 150 to 200 people conducted according to relevant health guidelines at the time, attended by national delegates along with some internationals. For example, it's likely that travel between Australia and New Zealand will be the first international travel to open up. We will also have a considerable online component that includes a mix of pre-recorded and live stream content, content accessible from anywhere in the world in order for international presenters to remain connected with Australian artists and their work. Next slide, please, Michelle. Though there is still considerably considerable uncertainty around how the pandemic will affect international mobility in the short to medium term, APAM believes it is critical to continue to gather and connect the work of Australian artists within the world. We will be working out the most effective means of doing this in designing the face-to-face -face program along the digital program and how they intersect. Exploring new ideas and models for future viability of the very internationally connected Australian art, art sector will be an important subject explored through exchange sessions in their gathering and in the lead up to the gathering through our regular wire series. Of the gathering elements you see on the slide, some form of each of them will be offered both in person and digital programs. And next slide please, Michelle. So, um, upcoming dates on Tuesday, the 16th of June, we, um, APAM has been hosting some um, virtual artist meetups and to kick the last round off, we will be um, hosting a First Nations artist meetup um, facilitated by Eugenia Flynn. And the Thursday after, so the 18th, um, we will hold wire number seven, performance, practice and post-pandemic. Uh, post um, and late 2020 prof, uh, profile expressions of interest for APAM gathering at the Darwin Festival will be opening up. Um, to keep up to date with our what's happening, um, I'll pop the um, link to our website 
on the chat and you can sign up to our newsletter. So Sarah, just in terms of that First Nations Artist Meetup, it's a Zoom-led thing. So when you go onto the website, you register and you get a link in the same way that we do with these webinars? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I mean, lots of work. I mean, I have a big question about why is it why is APAM important in this world? You know, when we see international borders and things, why does APAM exist, and how can First Nations artists uh, benefit from this structure? Oh my god! Um, yeah, it, it's important for us to connect uh, to keep those connections. Um, with, also, with our First Nations artists here in Australia and also um, just keeping connected, yeah, mm -hmm. and with the presenters from overseas and all of our um, friends and family in, um, overseas, yeah. Well, I know that the Australia Council has been very keen on the whole Tri-Nations Agreement as well. So yeah. from New Zealand and Canada, these kind of exchanges have been very important and I think APAM has been part of that uh, structure of building markets for First Nations um, uh, collaborations and, and tours. And it's, it's a way, like we were talking before, about the digital platforms for visual arts, that how do you create sales and livelihoods? How do you kind of uh, create markets um, so that artists can earn money uh, for things as well? And I think APAM has been traditionally one of those structures over the last 20-something years, 25 years, I think, almost. That's right, Wesley, yeah. Routine. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there's, you know, and the whole idea of uh, uh, APAM as well is, you know, not only to, um, you know, bring together First Nations performers, but also that it's also about um, how we develop our audience base as First Nations people with each other through the Tri-Nations ex Exchange. But also we've seen a lot of benefits come through with a, a growth in First Nations presence at APAM mm. and, uh, and seeing a lot more opportunity for people to tour their works and be tour, tour ready. Lots of conversation in the chat here, Leanne, just saying, you know, great, keep up the great work. Um, there's a link there, as Sarah said, about APAM if you want to register for that uh, First Nations artist conversation, which is Tuesday the 16th, next Tuesday. Um, to get involved and listen in and, and hear some of the chat, but also contribute to some of the chat about what's possible. Um, we might move on to the next speaker, then, Leanne. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Is, is, what's, I don't know what um, an OAM is, but it's, it's this side of being a monarch, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to say Nikki Cumston <laughs> is the queen. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Queen B. <laughs> queen B indeed. <laughs> Over to you, Leanne. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Nikki Cumston, OAM. Congratulations, Nikki. It's such an, a wonderful uh, recognition of the work that you've done throughout um, you know, your time within the visual arts industry. Um, but I will let you speak for yourself. You're the curator of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art, of Art, sorry, at the Art Gallery of South Australia, and also the artistic director and uh, founding artistic director of Tanandi, which is the festival of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander visual arts here in Adelaide. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Wesley. You're welcome. And it's wonderful to be here with, with you, Sarah, and, and with you, Francesca, and great to hear your presentations. Michelle, could you give us the next slide, please? Um, I'm, you know, really deeply honoured um, to, to really have been given this opportunity to present this festival. And I'd just like to give a shout out to the Aurangu artists who also received um, and OAM, I keep wanting to say OMG. <laughs> oh, that rolls off my tongue a lot easier, I could tell you. Um, and, you know, just to recognise, you know, their fabulous work and, and just how wonderful that, that they've been recognised this week as well. Um, and it's, it's just been such a shock and, and such, a, such an honour, as I said. Um, so Tarnandi, you know, it started back in... 
2013 and it is supported through the state government of South Australia through BHP and the the whole premise for Tarnandi came around you know being able to present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art um, and it's performing it's visual art it's you know it's sound it's moving image and it's really a way for us to be able to nurture and give people you know an opportunity really um, so if we could go to the next slide Tarnandi first of all I would like to acknowledge that that I live and work on Ghana country and have lived and worked here for over 30 years. And my own family are from the, the Barker, our Darling River in far western New South Wales. So I'd like to honour my own ancestors, but also recognise the Ghana people as the traditional owners and pay my respect to their elders, many of whom I've worked with over the years and who I've seen work tirelessly to bring the next generation up to be the elders of tomorrow. So really, you know, for me, working and living on Ghana country, I felt that, that the festival really had to have a Ghana name. So we worked for over three months back and forth with elders at Ghana Wara Pinchendi, uh, the language, Ghana Language Revival Unit at Adelaide University. And we didn't want to go to them with, oh, you know, this is a word, we want it translated. It was more about thinking about what it was that we were trying to do and what was a word that was going to embrace that within, within Ghana language. So it was really about providing opportunity, about providing new, new beginnings. And so Tanandi being a word which means, that, you know, it's, it really is about that first light of day so it's about a new beginning, it's about a new opportunity. And, and for us, it, it's really been quite fitting to be able to work with that word as opposed to um, bringing a theme to each and every year for the Town Indy Festival. So we set up um, the guiding principles. I've worked very closely with the artist, uh, with the, um, producer Mimi Crow and I have uh, worked, worked very hard together and set up you know the premise for Town and D around um, thinking about the guiding principles. We've also had a really um, engaging uh, conversations with our cultural advisory which shifts and changes over time. Um, so you know shout out to Leanne as being part of that over the years and um, you know many other really wonderful people who have supported us along the way but it's really been about thinking you know what are our guiding principles and they are to work very closely with the artists to hear what they have to say and you know to really let their voices shine and be led by what is really you know what is going to really support them to to be ambitious and to create works of art that they are you know wanting to showcase to a national um, audience and in some cases now also international and so we needed to come at this with an open mind and an open heart because you can't just put a structure in place you need to be able to shift it change it and you know on your feet it's not always you can't you can't always have a plan, then there's never a plan. <laughs> the plan is so loose. Um, and especially now, you know, moving forward um, for this year, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of change, but really um, what we've wanted to do with Tanity is to challenge perceptions and to really break down barriers and to provide an opportunity for artists um, to be able to create work of artistic excellence in order to grow, share and respect knowledge and understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures from right across the country. So the next slide please, Michelle. I put this image in just so that we could see, you know, this is how it was last year for the launch of Tarnandi. And, you know, clearly we're not going to be able to do that this year. So what are we going to do? How's it going to look? 
We're not sure. <laughs> um, but we are working towards a, an exhibition. It's a focus exhibition this year. And it's working, you know, we're working with artists who are passing on knowledge to the next generations. We've got 10 different artists and artist groups who are creating work. And from our liaisons with them, they are really keen to have an opportunity. The work itself, we're not sure what, what we can bring down. So, you know, there are limitations on what we're going to be able to present. But we're working on the catalogue at this moment. People are writing their essays and sending in their texts and the images. So we're working really hard on bringing that together. So we will have a catalogue. And we will have an exhibition. It's just the launch itself, we're not sure how that will play out. But I feel like it's giving us an opportunity to be really creative in the way that we can present what does happen here at the gallery to our wider audiences back in communities and out across the country and internationally. So I think we're going to be doing a whole lot of new work around how to present you know, what's on the walls and what are the sounds that are coming from these works. There's a lot of audio, there's moving image, there's photographic works, there's paintings, there's works on paper. So it's, it's really coming together as a, a really, you know, a really incredible exhibition. I'm, I'm very excited. You know, the, the closer we get, you always get these new little gems coming through in the emails and it's so exciting to be able to... Um, you know, think about how to present all of that. So um, here at the Art Gallery of South Australia, we have reopened. We opened last Friday. And so we're showing Monster Theatres, which is, of course, the um, Australian Biennial, of, sorry, the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art. And it's terrific to give that a longer um, time frame. So that will continue on until when Tarnandi opens in October. So it's been really terrific to have the doors open again. Um, you know, we, we have the limitations on numbers, but, but at least, you know, the doors are open and we're able to start thinking about how to, how to engage with our audiences again. So it's all very new. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Michelle. And I just put this in just to think about, you know, in a way just to, to let people know what, what Tarnandi is, and Tarnandi is a festival of contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. This year is a focus year, as I said, and there will be an exhibition at the Art Gallery of South Australia. We also have the Tarnandi Art Fair, which will, we don't know, as Francesca mentioned, for the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, we're still negotiating and talking with our art centres um, and, you know, discussing with them what, what is the best way that we can support them to be selling their works of art this year. And, you know, we don't know how that will unfold. But I just wanted to let people know about Town and D and, and it is, you know, an event which in the, in the, uh, in the other years, <laughs> it is a, a festival where we work with partners across the city of Adelaide as well as into, like, within the, the state itself to present other exhibitions. So in 2019, we had 30 other partner venues and events happening throughout, throughout the state. And it was really an opportunity for us to partner with other organisations and to give them an opportunity to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists and to start those discussions and those relationships, you know, across the board so that it's not just the Art Gallery of South Australia, in South Australia, along with Tandanya, of course, and the, Tan the National Aboriginal Cultural Institute, that other people take, take it on board, that this is, you know, this is about us as a nation being able to share and to learn from each other. So, so really, you, you know, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it really is a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to share our knowledge and, and to give people a way to learn. Which brings me to the next slide, please, Michelle. <laughs> um, last year, we worked really hard. So Thomas Reddit is our education officer. 
He's a Ngarrindjeri man. He's an artist as, as well as an educator here at the Art Gallery of South Australia. And Thomas and Kylie Neagle worked alongside of myself and, and Dr. Lisa Slade, as well as some of the, we had input as well from the Klugiru Aboriginal Art Museum at the University of Virginia, where we've worked together to produce 25 essential facts and trying to break down those barriers between, oh, it's very difficult, we don't know how to do it. You know, there's, you know, all of those excuses that have come from really people not knowing how to do it. And so we've been running some workshops here at the gallery and what Thomas and Kylie thought was we need a publication, we need something, that a resource that people can access. And so together we've put this publication, um, we present, and so, so now we can present from this publication. They've sold out the first print run, so we're on to the second print run. It's become very popular and it's, it's very, very um, easy to use. So I highly recommend it. But also on the Art Gallery of South Australia website, we have some really terrific resources in the education sector. We have some, uh, you know, a, a raft of videos where artists are speaking about their work as part of Tarnandi each year. We work very closely with Closer Productions to create portraits of artists so that people can see them um, and get to meet the artist and, and get a, you know, a hint of who they are and, and what they do. So we really, you know, I think it's come at a good time that we've had some of these resources to be able to share with people. And we ran the first um, Zoom session of our How to Teach Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art in the Classroom just recently. So we'll build on, on that and the knowledge that we got from running that. Nikki, there's a quick question here about are these um, resources online available as well? Is it easy to get hold of them? And uh, I see people putting it into the chat there now. So there are online, um, you can access these resources online. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so, so some of the elements of the full publication are available as PDF downloads and the actual publication itself can be purchased from the Art Gallery website as well. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. I put this in just to show, you know, the celebration that we had as part of Tarnandi last year, where the, we had 25 of the Tiwi artists come down um, to sing their fabulous Tatini into the art gallery. It was just wonderful to celebrate with them and to have an opportunity like this for all of us to experience it firsthand. But of course, that will be different this year as well. Um, so if we could go to the, the final slide, please, um, Michelle. So this is a, a short um, clip, which is the Tarnandi Art Fair. And I just thought I'd show you this just so that we can think about, you know, what is it going to be this year? So if it'll play. <laughs> In a, in a strange way. <laughs> yes, the bandwidth issue we were talking about before, sometimes it's difficult. We had the same problem before um, trying to do clips. But what we're seeing there is a lot of the market activity. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is the Tarnandi Art Fair. And, you know, it's really, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I think, you know, some of our conversations so far, if we could have the next slide. Thanks, Michelle. That's the final one. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because people are really grateful to us for reaching out and, you know, asking how they are and, and, and what is the best way to move forward for this year. And the, the responses are very mixed and, you know, some people are, you know, not sure about online because it's, it's not straightforward, but then other people are really they just want something to happen and so they're really ambitious and you know I think we'll just see how we go and and make our decision you know in the next few weeks so that people know what's what's you know what's coming and what we can do but just at the moment we're we're just all ears we're just you know listening and wondering 
at this point. Well, they say, I remember Elder saying to me, you have, you've got two ears and one mouth, and that's the kind of proportion through which you should actually engage with the world. Um, so <laughs> perhaps my mouth is bigger than my ears, but either way. Hey, there's a couple of questions here, Nikki, and in fact, we'll open up to the panel for a bit of a broader panel discussion here. Um, uh, Gina Gems is saying, what's the role of archives as well? Photographic archives, I imagine, through Juno's practice, but also other forms of archives for these uh, festivals and exhibitions how much do you go back into either the collections to bring out and recontextualize uh or tapping into the political um record if you like of of our of our people um nikki maybe you first anything that pops out for you well you know we've had some of the exhibitions that that we've had at at the gallery have looked at archival material um one that springs to mind is what if this photograph was by Albert Namajira? And that was looking at archival photographs, black and white photographs, that we believe could well have been taken by Albert mm. when he was with Rex Batterby, travelling through Aranda country and he was, you know, leading the way to all of those really important sites that, that of course, were being painted in those exquisite watercolours that, that, that we all know and love. And so certainly it, it really depends on what the artists, what the project is that they want to explore for us. We're led by, by these ideas that people have for themselves. And, and so, yes, we're open to, you know, of course, to our history and to looking at that and responding to that. Um, and I guess also within the Art Gallery of South Australia as part of our collection displays we're constantly looking at at our history and and bringing that to the fore might pray pose, pose, uh, pose this question to francesca as well um there's a question that's come through i mean there's a little bit of chat here ruth talking about chris Lilly needing a bit of a slap on the side of his head um and supporting briggs uh, call for more first nations content as a solution but also a question here about the relationship with mining companies and i know festivals I, I, I work for a festival as well and we have this deep philosophical issue about do you take the money and empower the artist to make a strong cultural statement or do you not take the money and have a kind of ideological shift and say no i cannot take this money it's dirty money i don't i don't think there's an answer that is uniform and is, that will solve everyone because I know on Stradbroke there's a, a, a sand mining company and I said, well, look, you know, we will take that money and we'll do something with that. So it's a different horses for courses. I mean, Francesca, have you dealt with this conversation before? Yeah, definitely. As, as a foundation, you know, we're very much um, mindful of um, who we approach um, and, and I think, um, and who approaches us. And we, we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, I think it's um, as long as it is Indigenous people or Indigenous boards or boards that have expertise to, you know, manage their festivals, that, that the decision-making happens there. And, and, and of course, there are reasons for and there are reasons against and and i think i think it does it does have to be dealt with on a case by case basis well we've seen recently ben wyatt who's the um uh, the minister in wa for indigenous uh, affairs he him saying that self determination means that these communities get to uh, get to decide how they engage with mining companies and who is he in this case to intervene or say you can or you can't uh, and it is a complex set of relationships in that way. I mean, Sarah Bell, just this notion too of where do we go into the future? Do we have to have more festivals, more opportunities to share? Um, or should we actually be thinking about our own communities more and staying in Australia? What's your feeling on that? Just make sure you unmute. There we go. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I'd like to see... For now, I'd like to see more focus of national and then um, when, it, when the time's right and when we can all travel again, we can do international. But, yeah, I think a focus on national would be good at the moment. Like, yeah, it would be nice to see right now. And I think, too, that these we've got a lot of exchange to happen, as I think Nikki and Francesca were saying there, Sarah. These 
we, we are already international in the way our, our First Nations talk to each other on this continent, that there's already a kind of internet, like seeing those pictures, Nikki, of the Tiwi um, dancers coming to, to Adelaide. I mean, that's number one, a long way, number one, and a bit weird, all the way would you go to Adelaide? <laughs> But this notion of the exchange that happens already in our um, in our kind of world. Just seeing here that uh, Clive's saying it's excellent presentations today. It's great. Um, uh, the, this uh, the idea of uh, holding a festival for the Uluru handback celebrations. 30, 35 years since the handback and acknowledge and enter COVID nineteen and welcome visitors back to a special place. It's interesting that there's been lots of calls to say, well, our tourism industry needs its, its boost. We should let people climb the rock again. And you're going, what? No, settle down. <laughs> you know, that things are actually, we need to look at how we maintain our values and all that way. Um, Leanne, any questions you might have for our speakers before we wrap up? Yeah, I do. Look, I, why have we not done this before? Why have we not built more of a digital base in reaching out i mean just looking at ourselves as first nations people within this country and the expanse of where we are and and about access why have we not actually developed this previously i know that we've had you know performances you know delivered out in remote communities where you know you can um, beam it back into a city or beam it out to the community just like to know your thoughts on that yeah, so, um, Leanne, I think the um, the real uh, practical issue for our uh, artists in remote um, communities, the the technology and the platforms and the internet connections aren't actually um, stable uh, uh, is one aspect. But equally, you know, you can you can go into Yetakala and there will be um, you know our, our ladies teaching um, courses, CDU university courses from their laptop under the shady tree. So in some communities, the technology is really good. I know with our art centers, um, they, you know, they, they um, post uh, photographs um, on Instagram with their phones showing a dead modem on the beach because, you know, their provider hasn't been able to give them the level of support that they need. And that affects them, um, you know, with sales or, uh, as well as having a presence on the internet. So I think there is a very real issue regard, regarding the, the practical aspects of the technology. Yes, um, but I think, thing. The Yeah, but I think, I think this, this will start to change um, because we're, look how much we have all, had to upgrade and um, engage with this new platform. But, yeah, I think there's a real practical aspect of it. And there are, you know, there are some of our community members who don't even have um, laptops. They may have mobile phones and that's, you know, something that, that will accelerate, I suspect, that aspect of it. All right. But, um, yeah. We need to we need to wind this up a little bit. I, I see. Oh, sorry. The book. Do you want to say something? Sorry, about? I haven't even been looking at the time. I apologise, Wesley. That's all right. Nikki wants Everyone. to say something quickly. I just wanted to um, shout out to the Australia Council for supporting the Tri Nations curators to publish this fantastic book, which is backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Becoming Our Future, um, Global Indigenous Curatorial Practice. And it'll be available in Australia from mid-August. Um, we had our virtual book launch for the Canadian version yesterday. And Fantastic. I wanted to you know, thank them for the support that they've shown us over the years of bringing us all together. So curators from Australia, Aotearoa and Turtle Island in Canada. <laughs> I'm going to push us on. We're, we're running out of time Fantastic. now. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Nikki. <laughs> For all our speakers, Michelle, if you take us back, we'll look at the Cherish Fund. Uh, we do need to spend some time talking about this, that uh, uh, the round opened on the 9th of June and it's closing on the 15th of June. It's very tight turnaround. It's very important. This is repurposed money. It's trying to get more money out to people to, to support cultural knowledge and artistic expression and also supporting workers in the digital world. So get in there. 
have a look at it. If you haven't, it's, it's closing on Monday. So you've got the weekend to write an application if you can. So get in there and have a look at that. Just that, that's the Cherish Fund. Check the, out the Australia Council website. Moving on to the grants update, as we've been saying, we're very responsive. There's lots of different things you can get on and um, make sure that you're being supported throughout all these things. Our next slide thanks the resources of the Australia Council website and the COVID-19 information and Facebook groups. They're all there. They're the same every week. If not, you can get on the Australia Council website and look at it all. Next slide, Lottery West still has its COVID-19 grants and Theatre Network Australia has support, $1,000 for independent artists. And next slide, some uh, Beyond Blue and especially around mental health to make sure everyone feels supported along the way. Um, lots of different resources there. Final slide there. Next week, Andrea James, Zane Saunders, or he's, he's in, and Gina Williams talking about their signature works, big projects. Leanne, why don't you give us the last word and we'll close it off. Oh, Wesley, the last word is get those applications in by June 15. I think it's midnight is the close. And that note timing. Yep. But everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you to all of our presenters uh, today. Francesca, Sarah, Nikki, thank you so much. Wesley, always such a pleasure, Treasure. Such a pleasure. All right, my <laughs> friend. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Be strong. And if you are going out to a rally, keep safe on yourself and make sure you don't endanger your community in any way. Look after yourself, your own health, and the health of your community. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.